Jesus-shaped people is a phrase we're going to hear quite a lot over the coming weeks. Because Jesus-shaped people is a program developed in Bradford by Gordon Day, designed to help churches grow through studying Jesus' ministry. And over the weeks, we're going to look at five major themes. And the first theme for this morning is meeting people, and in particular, out on the street is our topic. Now, I wonder how you feel about being out on the street as a church or as individuals. For some of us, that may be an exciting challenge. For others, for others of us, it could be anything but. It could be downright scary being out on the street. But the truth is, Jesus' ministry took place away from any central building. It took place amongst the people. And I think that's the first thing we have to note about Jesus' ministry, that he went out and he didn't look for safe options. He engaged with people. He encountered many Jews who actually thought he was a fake. He had numerous discussions with the religious leaders and teachers. Perhaps discussions is too soft a word. There were some conflicts with those leaders because they were about trying to expose him as a fraud. But he didn't hide. He actually talked with Gentiles. Can you imagine that? He spoke with the unloved. He even went to dinner with tax collectors. He healed the sick. In truth, Jesus came to minister to everyone. So I think that's the first thing we need to know from Jesus' ministry. That he went out to meet with people. He engaged with people. He talked to them. He tried to help them. He tried to guide them. And yet sometimes he tried to provoke them to think about things. To get a grip with the truth. Sometimes Jesus will say things to people that they don't want to hear. Remember the man who asked Jesus, what good deed can I do to get into heaven? And Jesus said, sell your belongings and give the money to the poor. That would not have been the answer that man wanted to hear, but it was the answer he needed to hear. The key to all that Jesus did and said was to help us to grow towards God. Sometimes that means saying things that we don't quite want to hear. Well, in the reading from Mark chapter 3, we heard that after yet another confrontation with the Pharisees, Jesus withdrew to the lake and a large crowd followed him from Galilee. And verse 8, I find very interesting. Verse 8 says, When they heard about all that he was doing, many people came to see him, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Now here's a question for us, I think. What was it that attracted the people to Jesus? Verse 8 suggests that it's what the people had heard about what he was doing that made them follow him. It was his actions that were attractive to them. The healings, driving out of demons, challenging the establishment, I think were the things that people were attracted to. And as we know, some of them began to think this was the man that would get rid of Rome once and for all. Well, I guess we can speculate on what it was that attracted them to Jesus. 
But it does seem that they came because of the things he did. He had performed many signs and wonders. And that made him interesting and special. And so they came. Well, I wonder what we make of that as a church. There are many schools of thought that suggest that engaging, churches engaging with people, perhaps are better not beginning with preaching the gospel. That letting people see how a Christian family is and behaves is more important. Making sure the local church is actually part of the community and displays Christian values consistently. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not in any way suggesting that we would hide the gospel from anybody. I truly believe God's word is all powerful. But I also believe in terms of this world that actions do speak louder than words. And the more I think about it, that whilst God's word is all powerful, he also gave us the freedom to ignore him. I was reminded of my grandma who used to often say about people, there's none as deaf as them that don't want to hear. And sadly, that's true in our society today. Therefore, I feel quite certain that reaching out to the community must be action-based, whatever that action is, with some sort of strategy and process behind it. What that action looks like, I guess, is for us as a church to pursue with God's help. Now, I know we already do many things in the community, the latest being involved with the food bank. That's a powerful thing to do. And I was reminded, as I thought about this, about a phrase that Bill Hybels used to use quite often. When he said, there's nothing like the local church when the local church is doing good. Nothing like the local church when the local church is doing good. And I think what he was saying was, there is real power when a local church is doing what it should and being an important part of the community. But I read the passage from Philippians and it also occurred to me that as we perhaps follow this course and start to shape and form ourselves more as Jesus people, then there may be some things that we need to pay attention to. In that reading from Philippians, Paul is imprisoned. But he writes that he rejoices, that despite all the things that are happening to him, he still lives and rejoices in Christ. And he wants the Philippians to be able to live in the same way. Whatever the world throws at you, stand strong together in and on the name of Jesus Christ. Because he's going to talk about unity. In verse 3 and the following verses, Paul gives us some instruction on the behavior and characteristics of a Christian family in unity with each other and with Christ. Can I just, I know you've heard them once, can I just read verses 3 and 4 to you again? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not look into your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I've read that many times this week. And it seems to me that if 
we're going to work on this concept of Jesus shaped people, then we have to start right at the beginning by being honest about ourselves. Not to beat ourselves up or feel condemned in any way, but rather to see where we might grow in our own lives and help the church to grow in its communal life. So I think hearing those words, I think we should all try and read them again this week. Look at them, think about them, pray about them and reflect how they speak to us. Because I think becoming Jesus-shaped people starts right in our own individual hearts. Because let's be honest, let's face facts, we are human and then most of us, therefore most of us, will do things that are selfish. We'll do things out of conceit. We may not particularly want to, but we will. But we need to try and stop. Because that's not the way to the unity we need if we're to become truly Jesus-shaped people. You can't find... In Jesus' ministry, any examples of his self-interest, really? He's full of ambition, there's no doubt. But his ambition is to serve others. To serve God. And through that, to bring people to eternal life. So perhaps... This is an area of growth for us as individuals and then as a family. Each one of us has been given gifts and talents and that's wonderful. But we should be using those for the good of the church community. We must guard against wearing our gifts and talents as a a badge of personal pride. And I know those sound like harsh words. But we all know what life is like in this world. The third element in verse 3, Paul talks about humility and asks people to value others above themselves. And again, I think we need to ask that question. Is that true of us as individuals? Can we honestly say that we never look down or criticise other people I think the chances are that most of us do but that's not the way to unity that's not the way that Jesus people would be and I struggle with this in a way because I am of the world and I know how the world works. I know how groups of people interact. But I also am a Christian and I have struggles within me about things like this. And so if you do too, please don't feel condemned but feel encouraged to do something about that, to pray and to ask God to help you. Because one wonderful image came to my mind. Imagine how powerful a family we would be if everyone looked up to everyone else. Because if everyone was looking up, then there would be nobody who felt looked down upon. Can you imagine that? To have the freedom to feel that nobody is looking down upon you. You know, we do hear, don't we, thoughts like, I don't get on with him, I've tried. I don't get on with her, I find her so difficult. Or we see people who really are trying to impress us with their own agendas. But they should be redundant things 
in a church family that has Jesus at the center. How wonderful would it be to know that we have respect and we care for each other. How empowering would that be? Paul tells us in verse 5 that in our relationships with one another, we should have the same mindset as Christ. So Jesus' people, Jesus-shaped people, will have love for others. Love that helps, that comforts, that encourages, that teaches, that doesn't judge, but also corrects. Love that serves, and a love that is given with true humility. And I said earlier, I recognize that that's not altogether easy to achieve because of our humanity, because of the way the world treats us. We do get pulled every which way. And it's hard sometimes to keep focused on that message of uniting with one another in Jesus' name. But if we get it wrong, that doesn't mean we should stop. If we get it wrong, we accept it and move on and ask Jesus to help us, to forgive us. Because I think as we grow more and more Jesus-shaped, then when we go out on the street, when we engage with those who don't know Jesus, then we will prosper more. In no little part because the people will see that we are who we say we are. That we want to serve in the community. We want to help. Yes, we want to lead them to Jesus. We want to tell them the gospel. But we want to create a right atmosphere for that. To lead people into a family that is something that they want to be part of. I must admit, I do find this tremendously hard because I cannot imagine not wanting to know Jesus or not being able to know Jesus. But clearly, there are many people who have that mindset. So I think we've got a big job on our hands. But the good news is, we've got God with us. I've just been watching the telly this Christmas and I'm amazed how many times Christians are portrayed in a bad light. I was even watching the soaps and we've got a, a minister who's been convicted of um, stealing, um, gay relationships, all sorts of things that do not show the church in a good light. And that's what we have to face up to. So I think the first step in this course is looking at ourselves, asking, do we reflect Jesus? Are we Jesus-shaped people today? Do we actually project the joy of knowing that we have a saviour who came to earth and died on a cross for us? Do we project that to the world outside? Do we show a desire to serve others without judgment? Do we open our arms wide to welcome people, all people? I think I'm going to finish there because I've thrown out a lot of questions, really, and statements. But I just want to say again, let none of us feel in any way condemned by any of these things I've said. Rather, let us feel stirred. Let us feel a desire to work with God individually and to work with each other so that we truly become Jesus-shaped people. 
Amen.